Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the PharmOS monthly call for May 13th, 2020. Uh, this call is going to be a follow-up to last month's call where we, um, we started digging into how to develop and customize uh, PharmOS um, as, a, as a developer. So the, the first part of that, we focused mainly on what you could do without uh, doing any coding at all. Uh, we recorded that and posted it on YouTube, so um, you can search for that. And we're going to do the same thing with this one, record it and post it to YouTube. This one is going to be uh, more of an in-depth on actual module development. So this is going to be looking at code uh, primarily. Um, and we're kind of working from a, from a document um, that, that Nick put together uh, with some, um, you know, a basic outline of things to cover. And, but it'll be kind of free form. So if people on the call have specific questions they want to see, uh, feel free to unmute and, and ask. And I'm happy to show whatever I can on this side of things. Um, I don't have a, other than this outline, I don't have much of a plan. So we'll see, it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, one thing I do want to emphasize to anyone watching this in the future is that it is for Drupal 7. So right now, uh, May 13th, 2020, PharmOS 1.3 is the current release. We're about to release 1.4. This is built on Drupal 7, um, but we're also in parallel working on the upgrade to Drupal 8 and Drupal 9. Um, and so a lot of the things that I show here are going are probably going to change when that happens, but I think a lot of the concepts are going to be the same. So um, it's still valuable to do this now, I think. And uh, and who knows, we may be maintaining the seven branch for a while, anyways. So it'll be useful to anyone running that. <clears throat> um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen, and then we'll uh, we'll get started. Okay, so this is the document that Nick started, and we we had been working from this last month, uh, where we we started diving into some of the things that you can do directly in the UI, not not in code. Um, so last time we covered uh, some things like what modules to enable or install, um, and maybe what we should remember to do is post a link to this document in the YouTube comments also or in the YouTube description so that other people can find it because we have some good call notes in here about about what we covered. Um, so we covered uh, what can be done in the UI versus code, how to use the views module to create lists of things in PharmOS, um, using features, the features module to uh, basically assemble configurations and export that to code. So that that gives you a good way to like do development in the UI without doing any code, but then you can export that to code so that it ends up as a module that you can share with others or put on um, uh, post somewhere. And sometimes that's a good way to get started if you wanted to create a new module is, you know, put some things together, export it as a feature, and then you can start adding your own code to that module that you produce. So um, maybe we'll do that today when we jump in, or maybe we'll just start a fresh module. Um, I can kind of show you what the difference between those two approaches is. Okay, so great. So other things we're, we want to look at is creating new asset types and creating um, probably new log types too. Um, modifying the dashboard, modifying log forms, um, creating new log forms and types, creating plan types and adding new flags. Okay, this is great. So we've got a good, good list to go from. Um, so what I'll do is just jump right in. We've got, um, I've got this development site set up right now on my local host. And this, right now, this is just a clone of, um, of a PharmOS instance uh, that I've been using for testing, but I've got basically all the contrib modules enabled on it. So I've got a whole bunch of log types here, um, a whole bunch of asset types, and a bunch of plan types, because um, I've been doing some testing on different things. Uh, and one exciting piece of, news that I can't help but share is that uh, Paul and I are currently working on a new crop plan um, module that is uh, is going to be, I think, pretty exciting. Um, still very early in the development of this, but it's going to make it a lot easier for uh, management of diversified veggie operations. Um, but we're doing it in a way that should hopefully be generalizable to um, to all kinds of crops as well. But it'll allow you to kind of visualize the the crop 
uh, the crop plan in a calendar sort of format like this. So probably won't get into much of that today. I just couldn't help but show it. Um, okay, so uh, what I'll do now is I'll jump over to uh, PHP Storm. So this is the IDE that I like to use for editing code. Um, has a lot of good integrations to it. Uh, it's not free, but it um, but it's worth it, I think. Uh, so I've got I've got this local environment set up in PHP Storm, and I'm running it in Docker right now, uh, following the same instructions that are on um, farmos.org/development/docker. So if you if you need to set up your own local development development environment, highly recommend using Docker for it. Uh, we've got a really detailed guide here for getting set up. So uh, I guess where to start with this? Probably the first thing to know is um, the diff where to put modules. I think that's a really good place to start. So, and, th and this applies if you're creating a new one or if you're downloading a, uh, an add-on module for FarmOS that someone else created. Because there's kind of, there's a few different places that you might think you want to put it in the code base, but um, there's really only like one correct place to put it. So if you're looking at the, the you know main document root here you'll see uh, so what this is is this is a Drupal document root this is what you get if you just download Drupal normally inside the profiles folder you'll also see this farm folder and this is really where all of the farm OS uh, code itself lives uh, when you download farm OS the distribution so this is where the the official core farm os modules live you don't want to put your modules in this one this is what gets updated when you create a new or when you download the new version of farm os and you basically replace everything in this uh in this code base so so you don't want to put stuff in here but this is where you're going to look to learn about a lot of things so you'll notice that uh um and here let me actually open up the github You'll notice that that's essentially what this GitHub repository is. So we've got, you know, all of our our readmes, our license, our um, farm.info file, and then we've got a modules folder, a themes folder, a Docker folder. That is that corresponds directly to this profile slash farm directory. So we've got our Docker libraries, modules, themes, and and uh, you know, readme and license and all that gets plugged in here. So this gets put in automatically during the packaging of FarmOS. So that's why we don't really need to have the whole Drupal code base in the repository. All we have is this, uh, it's uh, called a, a Drush make file. And the Drush make file says, you know, use this version of Drupal, um, include these contrib modules and these libraries of these versions, and use that to build the full packaged release. So that's what ends up getting created on drupal.org slash project slash farm. So that when you actually go and download FarmOS, uh, a packaged release of FarmOS, which is the recommended way of doing it, if you download this tarball or zip file, you're getting the full Drupal code base after Drush Make has been run. So it pulls in FarmOS, it pulls in all the modules that you need, applies some patches to certain modules, and then gives you a code base that you can just drop into uh, you know, a web server and start running. Um, so that's, that's the basic process, but the, the repository here by itself is really just the piece that's inside that profile folder. So uh, inside the modules directory of that, you'll see there's um, a couple of sub directories. There's contrib, uh, dev and farm. So contrib and dev, these are both automatically generated by Drush Make. Normally those don't those don't even exist in the repository. So if I go to our repository here, you'll see that really it's just modules slash farm that's available. And this is where all the farm OS modules live. So that's checked into the Git repository code. But the contrib modules are not. Those get put in by by Drush Make. So you can kind of see that here and that's why those are kind of yellow colored. Um, same thing with libraries. So libraries are not modules, they're like JavaScript libraries that are more general than Drupal, but are used by Drupal. So we have some libraries in there that we use. Um, so that covers what this profile slash farm directory is. So now where do you put modules that you want for your specific installation? Uh, basically that everything that you want 
that is specific to your installation goes into the sites folder. And this is a, this is a Drupal 7 um, concept, but uh, when you're upgrading FarmOS, the, the idea is you can download a packaged release and replace everything in your web root except the sites directory. The sites directory is what contains everything that's specific to your site. Um, and that has uh, a settings.php file in it, for example, which has information, which is where the, um, the database connection credentials are stored. So again, you don't want to overwrite that because then Drupal won't know how to connect to your database again. Uh, so settings.php is one of the things that needs to be preserved as well as all your uploaded files. So if you're uploading photos to FarmOS, those go into sites, default, files, generally speaking. Um, the default folder is where your stuff is going to go. There's also this sites all folder, and this is the this is typically the best place to be putting um, add-on modules, add-on libraries, add-on themes, those kind of things. So this is where I where I recommend everyone put stuff. So that would be sites all, and then you have kind of three sub directories: libraries, modules, and themes, just like I showed earlier. So modules is where is where you can put it all, and you can you can organize them however you want. I tend to like having a contrib folder that I put contrib modules in, a farm folder that I put farm modules in. Um, I also have a farmier module and one that I just have git uh, repos checked out in for for various things. But you can see if I open up the farm module, these are all um, contrib uh, farm modules, meaning um, they're not modules that come with FarmOS, but they are ones that the, that the community has built and contributed. Um, so I just have them all in my development environment here so that I can test them out and stuff like that. And that includes things like the mushroom module, which is not included in FarmOS, but you can download the forest module, grazing module, eggs, et cetera, et cetera. So this is probably where, this is where we'll start um, to create our new module if we wanna start creating a module. Um, so let me just jump back and see if there's anything else I should touch on this doc. Um, any questions so far before I create a module? <laughs> okay. So um, a module in Drupal is, uh, is very simple. Um, so I'm gonna start by just creating a directory. I'll call it farm underscore, um, test, uh, or I'll, I'll use, I'll use foo, <laughs> farm foo. So, um, in, in Drupal 7, a module essentially just needs two files in order to be recognized as a, as a module. It needs a .info file, so you do farm foo.info, and a .module file, so you do farm foo.module. And the, the farm underscore prefix on this is kind of optional. You don't necessarily have to use that. It's just, um, it's just kind of a namespacing um, standard that I try to stick to, to, to make it uh, clear that any module that starts with farm underscore is intended to be used with farm OS and not necessarily Drupal more generally. So I like to, I like to do that, but you don't have to if you're creating one. Um, okay, so the, the, foo.info file just has to have a little bit of um, a little bit of basic info and what I would recommend is probably just googling Drupal module development uh, and looking at the the Drupal the official guide on drupal.org um, you'll you'll find I, this might not be the quickest way to do it but um, definitely a place to, to find a lot of general info because again, FarmOS is really just kind of a layer on top of Drupal. So everything is really uh, Drupal things that we're doing here. So for this, uh, what I'm gonna do is just copy and modify an info from another module to get started. So I'm gonna open up the eggs module and paste this in, and then I'm gonna modify some things. And I'll tell you what each of these is as I do it. So this is basically just a text file. It has, it, defines the module's name, it gives it a description. Um, example module made during monthly call. Uh, it defines what Drupal core version it 
is compatible with, which is always supposed to be 7.x in this case. Um, and then you give it a, you, you say what package it, package it is in, and that will uh, determine where it shows up in the main modules list. So if I go to this modules page here, um, we have a couple of like groupings of modules within there that are uh, uh, sort of just logical groupings. Um, so in this case, it's just going to be Pharma OS Contrib. That's, again, just kind of a uh, standard approach. And then you can declare dependencies of that. So these are uh, names of other modules that this module depends on. So right now, this doesn't depend on anything, so I'm going to remove all those. But if we do anything that does, we can add that in the future. So um, that's really all you need to do. The, the dot module file itself needs to be there, but it doesn't need to have anything in it technically. Um, I'm just going to start it. I'll just give it a, a doc block. Uh, and and th this is just kind of following Drupal coding standards to have things in this format. You can find information about that. But so this is basically an empty PHP file right, right now. Um, but that should make it show up in this modules list here. So just to show you the different groupings I was talking about, we have PharmOS, PharmOS beta, PharmOS deprecated, PharmOS contrib, that's what I was just referencing. So if we look at that, we'll see a bunch of modules in here. And now here is our foo module, which just showed up. Example module made during monthly call. Um, so let me go ahead and turn that on. And then we can we can start experimenting with some things. Um, so that might take a take a second, but while we're doing that, let me um, let me introduce the concept of hooks in Drupal. And so this is a Drupal concept, um, this idea of hooks. And uh, you can find again find more information on by just searching probably just Drupal hooks. Um, so this is for Drupal 8, but it, it'll be relatively the same. So hooks are the, one of the ways that mod, for modules to interact with Drupal, essentially. Um, hooks are used for a variety of tasks, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, modules, uh, yeah, this is, I'll just, I'll just explain it myself. So hooks are basically just um, functions with a very specific name that get fired automatically uh, at certain points during the Drupal page load um, cycle. So Drupal is you know, just a PHP application. It starts up by running this index.php file and then goes through a branching labyrinth of logic to build the final page that it sends to you uh, as a visitor. So you know, it does that based on you know, what path you've gone to, what modules are enabled, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. During that process, uh, at many different points, it basically calls out and says, hey, are there any modules that want to do something right now? Uh, here's, you know, for example, like um, Drupal might be saying, okay, I'm going to build the menu system. Are there any modules that want to add to the menu system? And then it gives you, a, it, it gives you a, a, an object that you can add stuff to. Uh, which then gets incorporated into the into the build process. Um, so hooks are super simple. They're, it's basically just you you create a function. Um, so let's let's find a let's find a good hook to start with. I think creating a, a dashboard pane we did last month, and maybe I'll start again uh, with that as a good example here. So um, I'm going to go real quick to get this, but I'll, uh, I'll explain it in a second. I'll just copy this in. Um, so the nice thing about PHPStorm is it'll start to uh, autocomplete uh, on hook names too. So if I start typing farm foo farm dashboard panes, it'll automatically fill out this little doc block up here, but then it gives me this empty function. And now this function, um, I can use to define new uh, dashboard panes that should appear on the FarmOS dashboard. So let's just copy this example code here and I'll explain what that is in a minute. Um, but yeah, so I'm just gonna say tight, I'm gonna delete these things. 
just to simplify it a bit. So what this is basically saying is uh, return an array uh, and the the retain array includes one uh, element with a key of my pain, um, which is then an array that has two other properties to it, a title and a callback. So the title is going to be what the, the title of that dashboard pane is. And the callback is another function that will um, return the content for that pane. So let me, um, let me just rename that to farm foo dashboard content. Then all I have to do is come down here and say function farm foo dashboard content. And all, at the very, at the most simple level, all you have to do is return uh, a string. So let me say, um, this is my dashboard pane. So let's, uh, let's see if that worked. It might require cache clear, I kind of forget. So let's jump to open up the dashboard and see if that shows up. Stand by. <laughs> um, in the meantime, I'll also show you another module that's really useful that I have uh, installed. It's called the Devel module. You can download it from drupal.org slash project slash devel. And this uh, provides some nice handy features, which I can show you in a minute. But um, I have that in my sites folder under uh, modules contrib devel. So I just pop that into my sites, all modules contrib folder, so that I can then install that and use it there. All right, so that loaded. Let's jump back to this page here and see. Um, so I, oh, there it is. Great. So my pane title. This is my dashboard pane. So that's a very, very simple example of, you know, A, how to create a new module, and B, how to use a Drupal hook to, to add something to FarmOS. Um, so you can imagine it can, it can get as complex as you want from there. This, this function could um, pull in other information. It could uh, show a map, it could show images, it could show whatever, whatever you really want. Um, so the way that I found out what to put in this function was by looking at the, um, this, this particular file called farm underscore dashboard dot API dot PHP. So in all of the farm OS modules, which again are in profiles, farm, modules, farm, each one of these modules uh, may provide its own hooks. So that's something I didn't really mention, but Drupal provides hooks itself that you can use to, to modify Drupal. Farm OS does the same thing and provides its own hooks on top of that that allow you to do Farm OS specific things. So the dashboard module, for example, provides that hook to create dashboard panes. And um, so hooks are always documented in these uh, .api.php files. So in order to see what's possible, you know, what you could do is you can go into each of these farm modules and look for the .api.php one. So here's one in the farm access module. Um, here's one in the farm API module. Uh, here's one in the farm area module. And in there, that code never runs. It's just there for generating documentation. Uh, and it's actually used to generate api.drupal.org, which, uh, which is a um, really, really helpful for, for saying like, you know, hook form alter. You can see what the hooks that Drupal provides are, um, are useful for. Oops, I'm getting a internet connection is unstable. Hopefully everyone can still hear me. But uh, let me try this. Um, can everyone still hear me? My internet seems to be going slow. I'm not sure if I'm frozen. Uh, can I get a, an audio um, confirmation there? It's being a bit interesting. It's um, breaking up a little bit. Oh, OK. Uh, well, let me know if it's getting so bad that I should repeat myself. 
Sounds a bit more stable now. Okay, cool. Um, so, so again, these .api.php files, they're structured in a specific way so that they can be used to auto-generate hook documentation like this. Uh, so we can see on api.drupal.org, this hook form alter is documented and it shows a lot of information about uh, what the parameters are for that, how to use it, um, as well as some example code for, for what it, how it works. Now we don't currently have, so api.drupal.org does not include FarmOS hooks, but one of the things we're thinking about doing is setting up our own version of this. Uh, that we host ourselves um, to to show those to make those things available on the web, but until then you can you can just look up the documentation within these .api.php files themselves. So in the dashboard one that I just showed, um, you know it shows this hook here defines form farm, farm dashboard panes, returns an array of farm dashboard pane configurations, and then it has an example of what uh, what it needs to look like. So that's what I copied over. It also shows that there's other options that I didn't use. Like I could pull in a view. Uh, we, we covered what views are in the in last month's call. So I could make a pane that actually just pulls in a view. Uh, and that's that is what um, that is what these ones are doing, like this upcoming tasks uh, and late tasks ones. So maybe it makes sense to show that real quick to so you see what what that looks like. Those are created, I believe, in the farm log module. Um, and they're in this farm log .farm dashboard inc. And yeah, so here's the implementation of hook farm dashboard panes. Uh, and so I don't know if I really, I, I might have skipped over this part, but when you're creating the, when you're naming the function, it just has to, you just replace hook with the name of your module. So in this case, the module is called farm log. So the function name needs to be farm log da farm dashboard panes. So hopefully that was clear. But then in this case, what this is doing is loading up the farm log view and saying it wants to use the block upcoming display of that view. Um, it's also putting it into a special group and giving it a weight so that we can uh, you know, define how, how that gets sorted and ordered and things like that. So that's the basic concept b behind hooks and how you can use them to kind of modify uh, FarmOS. It's super powerful, and there's there's uh, you know so FarmOS provides a bunch of hooks itself, but then Drupal provides uh, you know a ton of even lower level ones that that allow you to do almost anything you want. Um, like for example, we could do uh, let's see, I'll do function farm foo page alter. And so um, I might need to ref refresh the cache for this, but let's just let's just set a breakpoint right there. So I'm going to use the the X debug and the my PHP storm debugger on this to to step through so we can see what's going on. Um, let me just try reloading that and see what happens. I might need to clear the cache. Okay, yeah. So some hooks this is this is important to know. Some hooks uh, get cached, meaning like um, they won't be immediately picked up when you add them. So sometimes you need to clear the cache of Drupal in order to uh, in order to have those show up. So it's really good to know how to clear the Drupal cache for a lot of reasons. Um, and there's there's uh, a couple ways you can do that. One is to go without installing any other modules or, or doing anything else. The e the easiest way is to go to um, admin configuration development and performance. And on this page is uh, just a handy dandy clear all caches button. So I'll just go ahead and do that. Um, the other option, if you have the devel module, is you can just go to localhost slash devel cache clear. And that'll do exactly the same thing. Um, the uh, uh, third way to do it is via drush. And drush is a command line uh, Drupal um, tool. So you can run commands in your terminal like drush cc and what that'll do is clear the caches for, for the site. Clearing caches can take a, can take a little while. Uh, so you just got to be patient for that. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, uh, I can show a couple of other hooks real quick. 
So one, one that might be of interest to people is in the farm area module, uh, you, can, you can add um, uh, more area types. So let's show uh, an example of that. So in this module, we're implementing that in order to provide the building type, the field type, the landmark type, and the property type. So this is a this is a FarmOS module that's using the hook of another FarmOS module to provide area types that can be selected uh, when you're mapping your farm. Um, oops. Okay. So my debugger just picked up this, which means that it's uh, it's working. Let me let, just let that continue. Um, and so notice what when you're defining area types, you you basically give them a, a machine name, um, machine readable name, a human readable label, so building with capital B. But then you can give them styles too, and the styles correspond to the FarmOS, the styles available in FarmOS map.js. So for example, we're making buildings red, uh, fields are yellow, landmarks are orange, property is purple. And so you can have modules that that add new types. Uh, to that, to those options. I think that was one of the things in this in this document. But if not, that's how you do it. Uh, okay, so cache, caches are cleared. So now, if I um, come back to this dashboard and I'm going to get back to my breakpoint here on this page alter hook, um, this should be fun because this is this is kind of a lower level Drupal hook that uh, gives you control over a lot of deep stuff within the, the page that's being rendered um, itself. So just waiting for this to get picked up. Ah, there we go. OK. So notice my debugger stopped on that, on that line that I created here. Now we can see what's going on or what you know what we have access to within this hook. Um, we have this page object that got passed in, uh, and this gets passed in as by reference. So that means you can make modifications to it in this hook. This function doesn't need to return anything. It just needs to change this variable in some way. So the page variable gives us a whole bunch of stuff, um, but the content is probably the most, Im most important. So you've got content, then system main, um, oh, then look at this. We've got all of our uh, our uh, the panes for upcoming tasks, the panes for late tasks. Uh, we've got um, oh, here's our custom pane title. So we're actually like able to even preempt that one. Um, here's the metrics block, uh, things like that. So you know, I could I could go in and alter any of this stuff, and it's very very raw at that point. Um, and there's probably better ways to do whatever you want to do if you're trying to get to this. But sometimes we use this hook to you know, add certain things to the page that wouldn't otherwise be there. Um, so I don't think I'll do anything with this right now. I just kind of wanted to demonstrate that. Um, so what other, what else can we talk about? Let's see. Um, we could dive into creating new asset types. That's a little bit of a that's a little bit of a bigger one, but I know that that was one of the main things that kind of spurred this whole discussion to create these recordings. So maybe I'll do that. I just want to look to see if there's anything else first. Modifying the dashboard, we did modifying log forms, um, uh, adding new flags. I can do this one real quick. This is a quick one. Adding new flags. So the flags uh, are a simple hook, and that is documented in the farm flags module. So you open up farm flags, go to farmflags.api.php, and here's an example here. Hook farm fla flags. So what I'm going to do is just copy this function, and I'll replace hook with farm foo. And I'm going to just provide my own flag called foo. Uh, so that's that. Now, if I go in and add a log, or you know, I'll add a flag. So flags get applied to logs, assets, and areas. Um, so let me add a, an asset, and I'll 
create a um, simple one. I'll create an equipment asset. Is it possible to specify the flag to only work on logs or has it got to be for for all? Yeah, unfortunately, flags are used on all uh, logs, assets, and areas. There is another option, though, log categories. And log categories only get applied to logs. So those are kind of two different things. Log categories are actually a taxonomy. Um, so you can, you can actually create those through the UI. You don't need to use a hook. But we do have a hook that will allow you to essentially create a new category automatically when the module gets installed. So maybe I'll show that in a second. But now if I scroll down, we should see, yep, there's that new foo flag that's an option. So I can, I can start flagging uh, equipment. Um, I'll call this the foo tractor. And now that should appear uh, on our equipment list. We should see a little icon that includes that foo flag. So having a view for, let's say, logs with the foo flag wouldn't 100% work because you've also got potentially equipment that has that same flag. Uh, well, if you created a... That, it's just for log. Right, yeah. So you could add additional filters. And when you create a view, the first thing you have to do is say, is this a view of logs? Is this a view of assets? Is this a view of areas? So you kind of have that filter right from the, from the get-go. So yeah, that would work. Um, yep, so there's my foo flag that gets applied there. Uh, and we'll also see that in the equipment list itself, we should. And um, notice that it's it's kind of a gray color. So there's another hook you can use to apply classes to those. Uh, um, let's see, so there it is. And you see my little foo flag there. There's another, uh, another hook provided by the same module. Um, if I look in this again hook farm flags classes alter. And so that allows you to add a class to that little, uh, to that little div. Um, and then, so then you can add CSS also to, to style those however you want. Um, and we're, we're using some bootstrap uh, in the, in farm theme, we're applying some bootstrap classes to the, to some of the flags now um, to just use the kind of, standard color scheme that FarmOS uses from Bootstrap. Um, so that's so that's flags. Uh, I'll show the category thing real quick because that's easy too. I was thinking it might make sense to talk a little bit about like dependency hierarchy. Like so you're uh, with the hooks uh, it gives you kind of an inversion of control where mm. exposes the ability to extend itself and then things that depend on it are now able to modify the you know things up up the dependency hierarchy um it might make sense to talk a little bit about how like how to think about where to put your code dependency wise that's great yeah um so yeah and that's a really key point about hooks is that they are technically soft dependencies because they'll only fire if the code that that creates those hooks is enabled so the farm flags module has some code in it that will fire off all the flags hooks to say, give me all your flags and I'll, and I'll create them for you. But if that module is not enabled, those hooks never fire. So essentially, I don't need to explicitly say that this module depends on the flags module. Um, it basically is just saying, hey, if flags module is enabled, then like here's some flags that, that it should use. So that's kind of nice. Um, but for your if you're creating a custom module and you know you want to ensure that when you install it those other ones get installed too then you can put those in as hard dependencies in the info file itself so then in here i would come and say uh, dependencies farm flags um, the other time you definitely want to do that is if in any is if you you know use any functions or make any function calls that are provided by those modules so you know maybe in another one i'm i'm doing like farm flags uh load or something like that and um you know it's kind of safe for this for this 
function call to be inside this hook because if the farm flags module isn't enabled, this hook will never fire, therefore this code will never run. But if you're using this in a in another place where like that may run, you want to make sure that like that the module that provides that function is enabled. Otherwise you'll get a PHP function not found error. Um, so so hard dependencies are generally uh, um, for two purposes, I, I guess. Uh, you know, one purpose is um, ensuring that certain modules are enabled uh, when you enable your module, and that may not be that may not be a hard requirement. But you're saying like, okay, I want, I definitely want to make sure these other ones are enabled because that's key to my to my user experience, per se. Um, and then the other one is like really hard requirements where you're you're using code from another module that you uh, would cause a PHP error if you didn't, if that makes sense. So it's it's definitely a little bit soft. It's a little bit fuzzier than something like Composer that uh, you know is a dependency manager um, and will will help you to. So PHP Composer, for anyone else listening, is kind of like npm uh, for JavaScript or uh, PyPI or you know pip for Python, which allows you to to like pull in module uh, pull in packages specific versions and and manage all that. Um, these are not quite that strict. This is this is just you're declaring what what you think to be the, to be your your dependencies in here. So it's a little more freeform. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's super helpful. Um, one other area, I guess, that dependencies come into play is like uh, you talked last time about fields and you know data types and uh, views. And so there, I can imagine there could be uh, slightly different interactions with the, um, especially with the data types where, um, uh, you know, uh, we got into on the issue about like um, how that inversion of control has some weird side effects with um, providing fields, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah. I don't know if a tangent for this call or not, but. Um, yeah, I think you're, and you're specifically referring to probably the dynamic fields yeah. module. Yeah, I, I hesitate to even look, talk about that one because that's that's like deep that's deep even for Drupal uh, and generally you won't be running into that problem unless you're really trying to do something something special um, but but it is a good question with regard to uh, dependency management especially if you're using something like features and including views configuration that has certain assumptions baked into it um, on, so on the last call, we I showed how to kind of create a features module. So you you know you could build a view in FarmOS um, and then export that configuration to code using features. And one of the nice things about that is features actually has a bunch of um, intelligence built into it to figure out what dependencies it needs. So it will actually look at your views config and say, oh okay, you're using this field and this field and this field. Uh, those are coming from these modules, so add automatically add dependencies to this .info file. So it's pretty smart in that way if you're using the features module to do that. Um, but if you're adding additional stuff to a module that you created via features, you're going to want to make sure you add those dependencies yourself. Um, and that barring that dynamic case, um, you would just want to put, say, common fields in a module that that um, other modules depend on and, and the yeah. only direction of the dependencies go that direction. Yeah, that's a good good point. And um and maybe I can show one example of that in FarmOS. We we have a, a module called Farm Fields, which actually provides some common field types that are used by other modules. And so the, a lot of other modules will depend on this module. So it's kind of a lower level module. Um, so that includes, for example, well, here I'll open the info file. That includes like the farm asset reference field, a standard date field, a description field, a files field, an image images field. So these are all kind of like common fields that most asset and log types are using. So we, we have the the base field definition in this module, but then the field instances in the modules that are using that. And so they depend on this for that base, but then they have their own field instance, uh, which defines like, you know, this is how that field works on this entity, kind of. If that makes sense. 
Um, Thanks. Sure. Yeah. So I'll, uh, I, as always, we're going through the time really quick here. So I'm just going to show point to the log categories one just to, to show um, David that. So there's a, a hook farm log categories. And what this does is provide a list of log categories that should be created when the module is installed. Um, so that, that will essentially just populate the, the taxonomy of log categories options that are available uh, when the module is installed. So that's, um, uh, it's kind of just a helper. Um, I still have a little kind of some mixed feelings about it because it, it ends up creating this whole vocabulary that maybe you never even really need to use, but it's, uh, uh, okay, we're back. We had a little, little interruption there. Um, so let me share my screen again and we'll get back to where, where I left off. Um, so I don't know where I got cut off, but I was showing the, uh, the log categories uh, hook. So that's a pretty simple one. Um, so yeah, before the end, let's, let's jump into the more complex one with five minutes remaining uh, for how to create a new asset type. So uh, this one's a little bit more complicated because, um, but actually maybe not. Uh, I could probably describe it for the most part without kind of walking through a lot of it. Um, there's, there's sort of one key hook that you need to be aware of for this. So first I'm going to delete these other hooks that I have um, and close some of this stuff. So the way that I would recommend creating a new asset type, and this goes for logs also, if you're creating a new log type, is to uh, one of two ways. Um, either create the logger asset type through the UI, like I kind of showed on the previous call, where you go into uh, manage, configuration, um, farm asset types. Uh, and then from here you can create, you can create a new type that is not stored in code, but is just stored in the database. So, you know, I can say add farm asset type here, and this shows all the existing ones that are already uh, in the, in the system. You can create a new asset. Well, hoping for the best here. It's categories. Maybe we should not talk about categories. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I knew we were pushing our luck. <laughs> uh, hopefully this works. We'll see if the record, if we've got three different recordings now. Um, but yeah, so picking up where I left off, if you're creating a new asset type or log type, create it, one way is to create it through the UI here, export a feature module. So that will create your feature module to start with that code uh, included in it. And so that would look something like this. If we, if we opened up, for example, the farm equipment module, um, features adds a bunch of stuff to the info file here about what it's providing. So for example, this features, this equipment feature provides some field bases for the manufacturer field, the model field, the serial number field. It also provides the asset type itself for equipment. Um, and then- We can't see your screen by the way. Oh, dang, thanks. <laughs> Man, we were going so smooth there for for the first part. Uh, so here's that info file for, for the equipment module. So this was created by features and features will automatically add a bunch of information like this, um, what asset type it's providing, uh, the field bases, the field groups, field instances, um, and views that it's providing. So uh, it'll also create this .features.inc file, which has the actual code that creates that asset type. Um, so one way to do this is to go through the UI, create your asset type, then export it to a feature module like this. Or you can just start with one of these other modules and copy the code over and modify it to, to work the way that you want. Um, that works pretty well too. But to create a new asset type, you basically need three things. You need to create your asset type in code. You need to create a view of those assets. So that is what would be displayed under this assets and then type here. So the equipment view is kind of what I'm referring to. Then finally, you need to implement hook, uh, hook farm UI entities. So this is kind of the key one here. And all you really need to do there is ignore this log one for a minute because all we're focusing on is the asset type. You just return an array that has farm asset, your asset type, the label and the label plural, and the, the name of the view that it's that it is using. And what this hook does is hooks into the, the farm UI system, basically that 
has a bunch of logic in it to automatically create things like um, like the breadcrumb that you see up at the top and the the these links to you know add logs uh, action links like the green add logs to assets and things like that. Um, so that's just kind of some glue code that FarmOS provides from the Farm UI module, and uh, and that's what kind of ties it all together. So you know you need your you need your asset type, your view, and this code to to describe to to FarmOS how those relate so that it can do the rest. Um, and that's kind of the the, <laughs> the quick overview of how to add asset and log types. So you know if we look at some examples real quick. In the farm equipment module, um, and this is a great one to just start with, I think, but notice how one of the first things in this module is it has an include once of that farm equipment.features.inc. This line is automatically added by the features module. So when you export a features module, you'll essentially end up with a bunch of files in a folder and an empty module file like this with one line in it that just pulls in the farm equipment.features.inc. So then it kind of leaves it up to you to say, okay, do you want to add any other code to this module? And you can do that in the dot module file. So that's what we're doing here. So the other things in this equipment module uh, are this implementation of hook farm UI entities. Um, ah, so we're also implementing log categories hook um, to provide an equipment log category. Uh, and then there's, it's doing some other stuff. I probably won't get into all of these things. Oh, one thing is um, FarmOS will automatically create CSV importers for your asset and log types. And that is, that will, you know, create a, um, so if we go back to the equipment page, uh, that'll create this little purple button here that says import equipment. So it's, uh, it's pretty smart about just creating uh, that automatically. But if your asset type has any special fields on it that, um, that are unique to that, that FarmOS doesn't know about, you can describe to the importer code what those fields need to look like, what, how they map to it, and stuff like that, so that they just end up in your importer automatically. So that's what this hook feeds importer default alter uh, function does. So uh, again, I always recommend like if you're trying to figure out how to do something in FarmOS and in Drupal more generally, think about something that FarmOS is already doing that's similar and try to see how it does it because it's a good way to to kind of learn the system and and see what hooks are available and learn that way. Um, but it does just require a lot of uh, uh, trial and error and learning what uh, what hooks to use for what. So as always, you know, come to the FarmOS chat or post to the forum if you have specific questions, and I'm happy to point in the right direction. Um, it's it's one past the hour right now, so I think we'll try to wrap up. Um, is there anything else that people would like to see before we do? And I'm just skimming this list again to see if there's anything major. I didn't talk about plan types, but those are essentially the same as asset and log types and how you, um, how you create them. Um, plans are more bare bones meaning you need to you need to create a lot more of the functionality around them. So I, I kind of, at the beginning of this call, showed the, the crop plan and what that's kind of starting to look like. Um, so if we jump in there. So this, uh, this interface that we're building for this crop plan thing, this is completely custom. Everything about this is being built in the crop plan module. Um, you know, down to building the table and doing all the logic for, for creating these things. Now, as we're building these, I, I'm always thinking to generalize and, and push some of this logic upstream into, into more general functions so that other modules can use it in the future. So that's kind of the process we're always going through is, you know, how can we develop this, uh, the specific features that we need, but also generalize it so they can be reused. Like a lot of this, uh, logic for building this table is very similar to the logic that we used in the grazing module for building uh, the grazing um, timeline. Um, so I, I actually kind of want to go back and, and merge some of those things together, some of those ideas in the future. But that's the basic idea. Um, so hopefully that, that was helpful. Is there anything else uh, anyone wants to see before we sign off?
Okay, great. I'm gonna stop this recording. Hopefully it all worked and um yeah, see you see you next month.